very, very, very humble. But more importantly, uh, so such an absolute pleasure to breathe the air that we all breathe in once in Kenya. And I'm very privileged to, to, to be here with you. But before I do that, I really want to talk about a couple of people who are doing some fantastic things in uh, co-running and saving the history or the written history of Goa and of Goa and Nikos. The gentleman in front of me is <laughs> Frederick Rico Marona. He is a journalist by trade <coughs> who had an epiphany in some dingy office where he was absolutely inspired by one of his lecturers about book publishing. And in fact, the guy turned out that they had already published 3,000 books by the time he was even 18 or 20. Rico has dedicated his life to preserving any kind of grown literature he can find and encourage any kind of grown authorship. You're, you're making it sound very uh, romantic anyway. <laughs> There's a lot of masala. I don't believe it's masala. <laughs> Our host, Leonardo, and his wonderful missus have given up absolutely brilliant careers in, digital, in the digital world to basically be the guardians and the pastors on, you know, the keepers of the storybooks, the keepers of the stories, and to spread the word and the written word as much as they can. And more importantly, they do it digitally as well. So if you want it online, I'm very happy to provide you with it. So there is, there are a bunch of poems today here in Goa. Come on in. Who are set going? Who are set guarding the future of books and authors? And uh, this book could not have been possible without this man. No, 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 no. Total. Everything. This book is really his work. I've only provided one or two words. We only packaged it. Okay. It's all your work. Anyway, we spent many, many nights. And, uh, and the reason why I published this book in Goa is because uh, I've already published a book around the world, and it's selling for $18 US. It really is not fair to sell a book by Goa in Goa for $18. So this is really a gift from me and Fred to all of our friends around this uh, 250 people here. Reasonable, Fred? Um, so that's the story of the book. And then the help of Leonard and all the other people around, we've been able to get it out to a few people. Tonight, I want to really focus on just one little thing then I'll be very happy to take questions from you because I want to have a conversation. And I want to take you back to where we were at one time back in that beautiful country. Um, what started in 1963 as a steady exit by Goans, the Goan exit is actually, actually started around about 1934, 36. First throws of the Mau Mau and all that. There's a lot of people who really started here. And especially around 1948, some of the, some of the people oh, who are working in the civil I service. Sorry. Come, come. Some of the people who are working in the civil service with the crown agents, etc., etc., had already started moving moves. What started in 1963 as a steady exit by Gones, the fact that there was no place for them in an independent Kenya, reached a crescendo with the exodus in 1960. Who left Kenya in 1968? Hmm. 1964? 1964. Yeah. Before that, there had been a steady trickle of loans returning home or families sending wives and children to the UK. The steady trickle continued to increase with the introduction of the work permits, the accumulation of the police, the so-called Kenyanization policy which introduced was introduced to force Asians to become Kenyan citizens. In 
1968, thousands left Kenya. After 1968, some families sent their wives and children overseas for safety and hung around until it was time for them to leave. After 1975, the, the once mighty railway thrown in with Nairobi shut down for lack of patrons. Goan Institute lost its name, and Goan Jinkana, once the exclusive realm of middle class Goan and Brahmins, was home to ghosts of the past, and any non Goan who wanted to join the club could join. Caste, class, village, color, religion, opposition did not matter anymore. In 1963, all of the prejudices that we as Goans had reported from God, suddenly died away. Maybe not totally inside each of us, but by the time I'm 60 again, uh, all of those things that captured the parts of each other sort of died away. Although most clubs opened their doors soon after independence in 1963, there were not many Africans and Indians that came along and joined the GIs in Mombasa, uh, in Kale, in Nairobi. Uh, I was a young parliamentary reporter and had the privilege of watching Fritz to sue the carry out his deputy speaker's role. He was also high school and precise with an uncanny mastery in parliamentary standing models. There were not many occasions when MPs argued with this quiet goal. He had a great teacher, though, the wise Sir Humphrey Slade, the speaker. I thought he represented the best in white folks and carried the unwritten banner on his forehead that not all white men were all evil bastards. The sad thing was I cannot even remember speaking to him. I was the prisoner of the post of independence topics. In my own case, Kenya gave me a career that took me to the halls of power in many countries and showed me a world that I could not have even imagine. From leaving school at 13 to become a chief reporter and then investigative reporter, my journey did not come easy. Yet, everyone, including Kenyatta and his cabinet, finished the thought I was a Kenya citizen. To the extent that I was went as part of official delegation to various countries, most African heads of state and their ministers recognized me as a king. Throughout this book, you will find that I lied. I was I, when I was 13 years old, I told uh, the chief accountant of the National Review of Science, I was in deep shit and he didn't help. And he asked me one question, how old are you? I said, 22. He says, what schooling have you had? I said, a high school certificate. I said, all right, come with me. And he took me into a machine room and gave me a job. So, I was 22 for nine years. <laughs> 14. I became 14, but I was still 22. I became 15, and I was still 22. But there was, I look back at the land of my birth with nothing but great fondness, like some of you do. We will never lose it. Perhaps there is one group of people who deserve this Kenya's collective applause. The Gorn, a small number of Gorn who um, What they did basically was, many of them remained for business needs. And that's not in all the time, because uh, eventually all these children left from the US, to Canada, to the UK, and you know, like they're gone. And, people that remain did a very, very, very important job in continuing to help the Kenyans uh, accept independence and make a good goal. And in fact, if you remember, it's further down the book, that at that stage, the Gorn women were absolutely, <coughs> absolutely, absolutely relied on. And if it hadn't been for the Gorn <coughs> The Kenyan government, the Kenyan civil service, could not 
could, could not have operated because the white, white secretaries had left in the first months in 1963 and operated until the Berlin Whatever the reason, the eternal survival instincts of the Gorns have allowed them not only to prosper, but also to become one with other Kenyans, which is something that most Kenyans are not able, most are not able to do. Some mixed marriages have signaled the infancy of assimilation, but it's not all the same. It's just a dog here and a dog there. Some, if not all, these very successful Gorns have ensured that the children left the country. There is one family that stands out. I don't know how many of you know Felix and Jane Pinto. Jane Pinto. They're two guys. They're they're an absolutely sensational family. And then what they have done with their business, they have actually captured the hearts and minds of all the Africans that they deal with. The philanthropy that they do is very, very culture is very smooth and, and I don't know the reason, but they call them almost the reason they should go to shop <laughs> later. There's always in all our endeavors, good, better, or ugly, the final truth must remain that the women, often the greatest heroines of the Gorn Hawk and the community collective. They were the foundation of the community as the homemakers of each family. I cannot say, I cannot find the words appropriately, pay a reasonable salute to the wonderful work that women, grown women did in, in Africa. Because without them, there would be no family, because the husbands are not busy out. And everything else was done by the woman point where one day one of my friends said to me, you know Skip, I really don't know what I'm going to do when she goes to go for six months. So who's going to pay the bills? And who is going to go to talk to the vegetable woman? And who is going to look after the servants? You are at a complete loss. I, I, was, I doubt there is a single family that does not owe its greatest debt to the mother. Where would our fathers have been without their wives' fortitude, faith, strength, character, and as emphasis of the domain, although in those early days the man was always the master of the domain. Mothers universally were God's own wonderful creation. Even, in though, even though in those times they walked in the shadows of their husband. Where I wonder would the cabinet ministers be, the permanent secretaries, have been without a devoted, dedicated, and utterly, utterly confidential Gorn secretary. These women were the real Gorn heroines in the run-up to independence, and were even more entrenched and silently powerful after independence. The bosses found them absolutely trustworthy, otherwise how could they have been entrusted with both national and private information, sometimes with the highest secrecy and of the most sensitive kind. Gold secretaries were no less headhunted by the private sector until the departure served, and until the departure served with incredible success. So much so that when some of them migrated to Britain, the transition was almost often seamless. It was the wife who often found work first before the husband. Alongside the secretaries, I would add the teachers, the nurses, the midwives, the radiographers, the lab technicians, the doctors, Many other professions women embraced in this beautiful country. Teachers, both male and female, deserve their own place in the history. I have never stopped admiring them, and that is perhaps one of the reasons why I love school, especially English so much. Gorn teachers would be, were among the jewels in the crown of Gorn progress. However, after independence, they played a much more vital role in developing the hearts and minds of young Kenyans for future leadership roles. Grown teachers, both men and women, actually taught people like Uhuru Kenyatta, the sons of Mwaiki Bak, sons of 
Jimmy Vichu, Sangha, the Guru Fernando, and the daughters. And today, these men are the leaders of Kevin. And all of you here who have done your little bit can be very, very proud. For having played a small role, if not a very large role, in the development of the men and women who eventually became the leaders of Kevin. Uh, one of my friends, how many of you know Tony Reg D'Souza? I know. Tony Reg D'Souza actually taught Uwe Rodinat and actually put him on his attention. He also, he also put Muay Kibaki sons on his attention. But if you know, if some of you know Lucy, Lucy Kibaki was a, mat, was, a, was a sleeping dragon because she, was in, she, she, she would smash away into the room grab Tony by, by his shoulders and say, now, hey, Susan, uh, why are you putting my sons in detention? Can't you see that I'm their mother? <laughs> yeah, don't you have eyes in the back of your head? <laughs> and she say, and now watch me, I'm taking my two boys home. <laughs> From that day on, Tony said, all right, part of this. At the famous Mary Hill School in Nairobi, Tony taught young boys who would eventually be in the leadership of the country and the titles of local industry. Many years later, many of them still remember Tony from now lives in Sydney, Australia, where we meet every Friday for a beer. And they drink and I watch. <laughs> <laughs> you still with your sodas. Ah, Among the men are those who men the customs and excise departments in Mombasa and the various airports in Kuwait. <laughs> and Harry Utado, the chicken in the rabbit for the Mombasa Gold Institute, who played for the ex students, who played hockey for the ex students, was one of them. And gold in Mombasa actually didn't it? Uh, gold in Mombasa actually. Come on, come on, come on. Okay. Okay. There's space for everyone. Harry, the Goans in Mombasa actually dominated the whole of the customs. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because that was four. Yeah, we, we, we were absolutely. It was quite something. Among the men are those who, who man the customs and excise department in Mombasa at various schools. These men in white protected the country with diligence that is reserved for heroes. Here as well stand the Goan men and women who made sure the railways were run to the highest efficiency on time and with the first class that was the envy of others in Africa. Goan chefs and stewards and waiters made sure the food was world class and the service was memorable. Here again an army of Goans trained Africans to succeed in a seamless transition. Perhaps the most flamboyant of the Goan professionals were the legal sect. To this day, they continue to do Goan's proud. And before ready-made clothes arrived, Goan tailors, my father included, were in high demand and had a reputation for excellent bala. Most of them returned to Goa after independence. But in those days, they suited all the safari sect, the great Hollywood stars that came to Kenya, all, this, all the people that ran on safari, and more importantly, all the white settler women who came from Kiritu and Manuki, Mary, all came from Nairobi to meet, to meet with Mr. Fernandez and Mr. Eugenio and Mr. Ferreira, and had the clothes uh, tried out and all that kind of stuff. If nation, if nation <coughs> building did not involve politics, the Kenya Gones matched the other migrant tribes. Gones had successes as individuals in various fields with no part played by the general Gone community. On the other hand, other South Asian communities strongly supported and promoted individual, act individual excellence. Other close knit even secretive South Asian communities were probably the richest people in Africa. As a community, Gones excelled in the areas of religious needs, education, charity, sport, club activities. As individuals, they excelled in many other fields. The Golden Secretary of Colleges were responsible for turning out Golden Secretary to the highest standards. I went to Golden Premier College in Nairobi. Any Premier College, ex-Premier College students? Well, find them on there. 
In the city, you learn shorthand and typing. Got the touch, but lost the shorthand view. Dr. Rivera Gold School in Nairobi and the Gold School in Mombasa were perhaps the truest epitaphs of Gold contribution to education in Kenya. To this day, those two schools will remain as an epitaph to all the mothers and fathers who have given their two shillings and their ten shillings and their twenty shillings and built those schools. And what wonderful schools they are even today. It has been one of the greatest achievements of the community, and there are thousands of it, a vanishing breed who will never forget it. In Nairobi, there were also a couple of uh, housing estates that also are uh, to the credit of Gorm. In Mombasa, one must not ever forget the uh, Nairobi Go um, Go and Taylor Society, the yeah. holiday <laughs> home for heaven. Gorms and South Asians, especially the Indians who dominated spice and floating bazaars, Indian shopkeepers would be found almost everywhere in Kenya. However, there is one group of people that the Kenyan government owes a particularly huge debt of gratitude, and these were the Gorm civil servants. Now, one of my very special friends, uh, Mervyn Maceo, has written a magnificent book called Wana Karani. Wana Karani really shows exactly how brilliant the Gorm civil service was. There was a large proportion of white DCs, DCs, DOs, etc., etc., who were in those positions purely because of their color. But it was the Gorm clerk, the Gorm treasurer, the Gorm paid clerk, all that kind of stuff, who actually did the work, actually did the exams. Not the pass marks, but did not get the promotion because his, his boss did the exam, failed, and uh, was stuck in his job and couldn't move any, any further. But again, without the board, there would never have been a British civil service in Kenya or in Africa for that matter. And uh, we who are still breathing really ought to remember them and those that have left us in, in, in our prayers and celebrate those who are around. As I said, Mervyn Messier Mes Mes will, I am sure, pay great hom homage to fellow clerks and civil servants. From early on, most of the brown Portuguese employees as far by the British were called Indian bubble clerks by some. People who didn't like us, the Sikhs and the Indians and all of that. What bubble will I have? <laughs> Various governors of Kenya, including Sir Evelyn Baring, have often pointed to their fine reputation for loyal service and to the fact that the most trusted member of the district staff was the senior Goan club. It was easy for the Goans to believe in this image and thus consider themselves not only a class of Asians but also as the favorite of the colonial government. They were quite proud of their newly inherited status. And when they returned home to Goa, they would emphasize the difference in their lifestyles adopted from their contact with the European Union, and some would speak, even in broken Spanish, to each other. From Kenya's dust, the country's DNA has entered the Goan bloodstream, and for generations to come, Goans would happily shout about their Kenyan accent. However, while they did not want to be called Indian or Portuguese, once they had migrated to the UK and the parts, uh, parts overseas, many were happy with the Portuguese name. The Goans waited with heavy hearts and sobbing and tears and trepidation for the future. They assisted in the training of Africans to do the jobs and thus facilitated the transfer of business from the Goans to the new independent Africans. The few who took up Kenya citizenship provided in short term longevity or experience in the job. They were the go they were the go to experts for the new employees. Equally goals of the medical fields are the same. Some doctors remained several years longer than longer until there were suitable replacements. It was this devotion to God that provided them with the faith and the strength to be generous to a fault. There were some exceptions to the course. As the final page was being written with the exodus of the majority of Gorms, it is ironic that this might have been their finest hour when the sun went down on colonial Kenya. The 
Thank you. 